Um, this brings us to the US uh, Department of State uh, language, English language programs presentation. So as you know, ours is a global profession. So now we're going to shift the spotlight to the role of the US Department of State in supporting English language teaching internationally and providing opportunities for English language professionals. So we're very fortunate uh, to have with us um, Russell Barzik and Terrell Hawkins, who are um, in the, the English language programs of the, the uh, Department of State. They will explain their roles. And um, the, the, the panel will discuss the, the programs and introduce uh, you to the experiences of some of the um, participants in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the English language programs. So thank you very much to the whole panel for your participation, for being here today. So um, it's slightly unclear to me whether I should turn it over to Terrell or to Russell, but um, uh -huh. very happy to turn it over to the State Department. Thank you so much. That's great. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, and thanks to you know, all of our organizers for uh, including us in your, in your conference today. It is a real honor and a pleasure for me uh, and all of us, I think, to, to join you. So happy Saturday to everyone. And uh, yeah, welcome to, uh, to this panel discussion with participants of English language programs sharing their experiences as global educators and cultural ambassadors. Um, as Mary said, I'm Russell Barzik. Uh, I'm your moderator. I am a Foreign Service Specialist uh, currently posted in Washington, D.C. as a branch chief in the Office of English Language Programs uh, in the U.S. Department of State. Uh, when I'm posted overseas, I am a Regional English Language Officer, or RELO for short, uh, I've served as a RELO in Rabat, Morocco, covering North Africa, and in Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, covering four countries in South Asia. And I'm an English language fellow and specialist myself. So uh, nice to meet you all. I'm joined today by three panelists. First, Keisha Bryan, who has been an English language specialist with a virtual project in Peru in 2021. Second, Hansley Cazo, who was an English language fellow in Montenegro this past year and is returning for a second year this fall. Uh, and third, Perli Leuven, who has just finished a two-year project in our virtual educator program, working with teachers in Costa Rica. Uh, before, though, we start our panel discussion, I'd like to tell you a bit about the many programs within our office uh, the Office of English Language Programs, which is part of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs in the U.S. Department of State. Our office provides a wide variety of English teaching resources and cultural exchange opportunities for U.S. American citizens on international projects, both in person and virtually, and for teachers and students in countries around the world. All of our programs aim to foster mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries, in addition to building English language capacity. For over five decades, English language programs has sent thousands of US American English language teachers around the world in person and online to deliver quality English language programs and to support public diplomacy objectives. There have been projects in all of the countries highlighted in color on the map. The English Language Fellow Program was the first program launched in 1969. The Specialist Program followed in 1991. And our newest opportunity is the Virtual English Language Educator Program created in 2020 as a response to COVID conditions and is now a standalone program of its own. The three programs share a number of characteristics. All participants are US citizens, have a graduate level degree and have a demonstrated commitment in the field of TESOL. 
All projects promote mutual understanding, as I mentioned, as part of the US Department of State's public diplomacy initiative. Both in-person and virtual projects offer multiple opportunities for cultural exchange uh, with the objective of building mutual understanding. And projects, all, all projects are designed by US embassies to build English language capacity at the local and national level. Uh, each program is also different from the others in important ways. For this presentation, I'll only focus on the top row of the table shown uh, on this slide, but for detailed information about benefits, eligibility, and the application process, we encourage you to visit our website at elprograms.org. We're pasting a URL in the chat to a PDF that provides the information you're seeing on this slide and the previous slide. Uh, but for now, just a brief overview of the length and modality of each program. Uh, the fellow program is an in-country exchange opportunity uh, lasting 10 months. Uh, specialist projects are between two weeks and three months long uh, when in-country and of varying lengths when uh, virtual. And the virtual educator projects are up to a semester long and are up to 10 hours per week. Uh, another program that our office provides is the Online Professional English Network, or OPEN, which partners with US universities, institutions, and TESOL professionals to offer online courses and webinars for international English language educators. All opportunities are free, and many are for an unlimited number of participants. As you can see here, there are live webinars, MOOCs, and global online courses that are all part of OPEN. Uh, here's a list of courses uh, available and the universities and organizations that facilitate them. Courses that are open right now include Teaching English for Young Learners, English for Tourism Professionals, uh, English for Career Development, English for STEM, and English for Journalism. Uh, you can register, anyone can register uh, for any of these courses at English Pro, uh, open English program. Programs.org, URL at the bottom there. And many English language specialists and fellows have written articles for our office's quarterly peer reviewed journal, English Teaching Forum, uh, which is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. The uh, forum is published by the US Department of State and offers articles that reflect current TESOL theory and practice for English language educators. Currently, over 30,000 copies of the magazine are distributed in more than 100 countries and are available uh, online at our main website, uh, AmericanEnglish.state.gov. Forum is a journal written for teachers by teachers, so anyone here uh, can consider submitting an article for publication. Uh, the American English for Educators Facebook page uh, has a global following of nearly 500,000 teachers and offers discussion on teaching techniques for new and experienced English language teachers. You can follow this page to learn about new programs and resources for teachers through our offices and find links to other social media uh, sites for English learners as well. Uh, so for our US American teachers who want to hear more, about opportunities through our domestic outreach newsletter, uh, you are invited to send us an email to join our mailing list at eca-oelp at state.gov. So these newsletters give more information about presenting webinars, developing online courses, hosting an in-person or online exchange, uh, and you can also learn about job opportunities when they're available, either in our office in the US Department of State or in one of our implementing partners. So our landing page for everything I've talked about today, uh, including Forum Magazine and other free resources for teachers, 
is here uh, at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. So all of you are invited to go there and uh, take advantage of any of the resources and information there. And now uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists and invite them to tell you a bit about their projects before we begin our panel discussion. So, Dr. Keisha Bryan is an Associate Professor of ESOL Education in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Tennessee State University. Her research focuses on Black adolescents' intersectional identities and the role of language, literacy, and racial ideologies in identity construction. She has authored several publications dedicated to issues of social justice and language education spaces. Dr. Bryan currently serves on the Editorial Advisory Board of TESOL Journal and Caribbean Education Research Journal. In her spare time, she enjoys listening to podcasts, shopping, and hanging out with her teenage daughter. So, Keisha, I invite you to say hello and share a bit about your projects, please. Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. I'm wearing so many different hats today, but I'm super excited to be here um, as an English language specialist representing to the program. I began working uh, with the program and at the end of 2020, well, the beginning of 2021, and I'm presently working with the same program in Peru. Um, I had the pleasure of working with three other dynamic specialists. We collaborated um, to deliver an interactive yet virtual PD to about 100 secondary teachers um, in, in Peru. It's been an absolutely amazing experience. We focused on both methodology and um, technology, especially during the time of, of COVID, so that these teachers were better prepared to, um, to teach English to their students in Peru. Our focus was having them to reflect on their practice and create a teacher inquiry project where they collaborated and they reflected on their practices, came up with a question or a problem um, that they had encountered in an English language uh, teaching situation. And they communicated with one another across the span of eight weeks to figure out what would be some of the solutions to that problem. We came in not with the idea of prescribing them the methodologies that they should use or the technologies that they should use, but actually giving them some of the tools and saying, hey, what have you encountered as challenges and how do you think you might be able to solve those challenges so that your students can better acquire English to do well on their IB and Cambridge exam. So each core team presented these challenges and um, it was absolutely amazing at the end. And at the end, uh, they created and presented their projects to one another. And so I think what our project did for my particular um, group of core professional development ELP specialists is that we created a community across the um, secondary schools that we work with. I believe that there were maybe five or six different schools. And in the end, they, they were in teams. And so now they can communicate across their schools about some of the challenges and successes that they're having. A wonderful group of teachers in, in Peru. So that was the first phase of our project. We're now in the second phase of our project that ends at the beginning or mid-August, where we actually are mentoring some of the teachers one-on-one. -on -one. So first phase, professional development in this group setting and building community. And now these teachers are actually in the implementation phase. And we meet once a week with um, these teachers. They provide us videos of them actually teaching and students actually speaking and engaging in English. And then we simply provide them feedback and they tell us what's happening in their particular context. So we're building community all the way around and it's been an absolutely amazing experience for me thus far and also for those teachers, those amazing secondary teachers in Peru that I have been working with. Great, thanks very much for that summary. It sounds amazing. Um, our next panelist I'd like to introduce is Hansley Cazot. Uh, Hansley is an English language fellow working 15 plus years in the TESOL field. 
His fellow projects include virtual projects with the University of San Jose Recoletos in Cebu City, Philippines, and the English Language Teachers Association of Montenegro in Montenegro. He's currently on an in-person fellowship in Montenegro, working with the University of Montenegro. In addition, Hansley is a recurring guest on the TTELT, Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers podcast. His specialties in TESOL include uh, language and assessment, development of literacy and speaking skills, and technology in education. Hansley, welcome, and perhaps you'd like to share a bit about your project. Sure, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, right now, I'm a fellow in, in Montenegro, in the Balkans, near Croatia, Serbia. And my project pretty much consists of, I was working with uh, Montenegro during the pandemic virtually, and then later moved on in person. And I work with, in a trainer, in a training capacity. So I am a teacher trainer. We do workshops on methodology and, uh, different practices like that. So if you look at some of the pictures that I have in the slide here, uh, the one on the furthest left, that was a, a workshop series we did with the U University Professors of uh, Cernagora, Montenegro, and we did an eight week course, basically developing speaking skills and teaching skills in the classroom. At the end of the course, we had a bit of a, a certificate dinner where we awarded those who completed the full eight weeks. Uh, it was an amazing experience, a great time. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, awesome projects. And actually these professors who completed this course will now next year, part of uh, our duties will to create, um, as part of creating sustainability in our project, we will, those cohorts who completed the certificate will now be learn how to be trainer or trainers. So they will be able to train their own colleagues uh, moving forward. So that's part of the project. The one in the middle of the photo you see there, I also work with the English Language Teachers Association of Montenegro, uh, the Public School Teachers Association. And we also conducted uh, a series of workshops around the country where we hit every major city, uh, which was really, really, really awesome and a great way to see the rest of the country However, uh, we, we reached out to over 200 uh, teachers in the country and performed this workshop on Socratic seminar, which was really amazing. And then actually, I just decided to, con to uh, include this last photo here is just a photo of day to day uh, enjoying, you know, being in the fellowship and some of the uh, sights and scenery that I, I get to see every day. So uh, that's, that's, yeah. Great. Thanks, Hansley. Your, your photos are getting some compliments also in the chat there, so they're, they're looking good. Um, our, our next panelist I'd like to introduce is Pearlie Lubin. Uh, Pearlie enjoys teaching English language learners how to become acquainted with and navigate the English language and culture. She has taught ESOL at Dallas College in uh, Dallas, Texas. She is a graduate teaching assistant in the Educational Leadership Department of Dallas Theological Seminary. From 2020 to 2022, she served as a virtual English language fellow helping in-service teachers improve their teaching practices and communication skills at the National Learning Institute in Costa Rica. A second project involved teaching students in STEAM. In addition to teaching, she is a doctoral student at Texas A&M University. Uh, Pearly, welcome, and I'll invite you to say some words about your project, please. Thank you, Russell. Greetings, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you all. And uh, my project uh, started off. Now I have to I have to set this up. Uh, you're going to see a picture on the right, and that picture you're seeing smiling faces and people are happy, but Honestly, that's not how it started. The teachers I worked with were the 10% who did not pass a new teacher's entrance exam at a place where they'd already been working. So imagine suddenly your job is on the line. So this is fall of 2020. Um, we were in a pandemic and they're afraid of losing their jobs. So they came in ashamed, embarrassed, demoralized. And so the first thing I wanted to do in this communications class is to create a community. So I 
let the teachers know I valued mistakes. You learn from them. And I asked them to help design the course because they're teachers. So they helped design the syllabus. They had input on what we had to study and we learned to collaborate. That was, it wasn't one of those things where we're competing, but this was a place where we collaborated. So by the time that picture took place, we'd already been working in groups. We already designed um, different lesson plans together. They had uh, been able to work on different projects. And on the left side, uh, that's the good stuff. On the left side are some of the issues that we had to deal with as a virtual educator. <laughs> so um, we had a lot of issues with the weather. You're thinking Costa Rica, beautiful, wonderful. No, we had storms, we had floods, we lost power. <laughs> and so we're, te we're using Microsoft Teams and I had never used Teams. So I learned Teams this week and then the tech who taught me, I invited him to the class and we recorded it. So we had that little um, cushion if anybody needed it to go back and review. And then we started working on building the class. So um, my fellowship was a great adventure. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the lessons I learned from all of the things that we had on the left that led to everything in the picture on the right. Thank you. Great, thanks, Pearlie. It's nice to see those smiling faces. So you must have done uh, something, something right with that group, right? Right from the, the beginning, I think. Okay. Wow. Well, what uh, what a great panel we have here. Uh, let's get started with some of our questions. So uh, my first question uh, for our panelists will be uh, simply, how did you learn about the program, and what mo motivated you to apply? And I will look to uh, Keisha to start us with this one, please. Okay, great. I, I learned about the program actually from Ayana Cooper. Dr. Cooper kept asking me, you should apply, you should apply. Why haven't you applied yet? And so I finally applied and I'm so grateful. And then Tony Hull, I'm not sure her position with the State Department, but I would see Tony Hull all the time at the TESOL uh, conventions. And Tony Hull continuously talked to me about the program, talked with me about the program. And so it was simply by word of mouth and by connecting with others who had actually worked in the program before or or had been um, instrumental in kind of promoting this particular program. And so I, I thought about it, I had to apply and I did. Excellent, nice to hear some familiar names there. So uh, great. And Pearly, how about you? How, how did you learn about the program and what motivated you to apply? I volunteered at a Texas State Conference and I went by that table a couple of times and I just kept being drawn there. So I actually went to the presentation um, on the second day in the afternoon and listening to the fellows who had gone and then speaking with Tony Hull about it, I thought, this sounds like me. So I applied. Excellent. Uh, another nod to Tony. So that's great. Uh, Hansley, how did you hear about it? Uh, similar to Pearly, uh, so I actually just Googled it, and I used to teach in Japan for a number of years, and I wanted to, uh, after being in a public school system for, you know, uh, eight years or so, I wanted something to do something different, and uh, I wanted that international teaching English overseas again kind of feel. So I was Googling options, and this popped up, and once I started looking at it, as Pearly said, I said, oh, this, this looks like I can do this. I got this experience, so sure, why not? Excellent. All right. Well, thank you uh, for your responses to our first question. Next, um, I'd like to ask, uh, can you talk about your experience as a Black American serving as a cultural ambassador for English language programs? So a second part uh, to that question, what challenges and opportunities did you encounter during your project? And what kind of support did the program provide, um, if any, if, if applicable? Uh, so, Pearly, we'll ask you to start this time. Um, I didn't have, as, as a virtual educator, I have to say this, when you're coming into the classroom, teachers see you as the expert. So I didn't have um, that much to deal with as far as a virtual environment with teachers. But I will say that it's a great opportunity to share culture, depending on what it is you're teaching. So we studied um, persuasive speech and I thought, okay, how can I express um, 
um, the African American culture to my to the teachers in this class. So we looked at um, Dr. Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech in terms of the three appeals. Uh, pithos, lagos, pathos. And when we did that, we talked about the different elements. So things like that, there are opportunities to share. And so um, it was great to be able to share some of the experience of um, African-American culture here with the students. Um, and I will say the support that I gotten, um, I've, the, the Washington has always been available if I needed it, but I didn't really have any issues, so. Great, thank you. Um, Hansley, can I ask you to answer this one next? Sure. Uh, so I am a fellow Montenegro. And just to give you an idea of the population, um, I, I agree with Pearlie. My, my coworkers and the people I work with around me, no problems ever whatsoever. Issue, uh, whatsoever. However, uh, being, in a, you know, being in person, it's more than just the people you work with. You're also with the country, and there there have been experiences, both positive and negative. But I mean, overall positive, but um, nothing that I guess you maybe you might not expect. But the population of Montenegro itself is um, it's 95% homogeneous. So most people are from Croatia, Serbia, or in around the area of the Balkans. Um, but you know, it's it's overall been super positive. I, I've had plenty of opportunity to to share. And as far as um, most of it is a lot of curiosity about where I come from or some of the things that culturally I have. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I think, it, it, you know, overall, no problems, no problems whatsoever. Uh, overall, it's been great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thanks for that. And uh, Dr. Brian, would you like to speak to this question? Sure, sure. My experience has been absolutely wonderful. I've had the opportunity to um, answer any questions that um, the the teachers would have about Black American culture. So the challenges were few, the opportunities were many. Um, and what for me, what it, it was a joy to actually speak with those teachers who were from parts of Peru who that have um, a large indigenous population because they were able to ask me, what is it like being a minority in this person in the US context? And they tried to kind of, you know, see if there were similarities and differences and what could they do to make sure that their teaching was culturally responsive for those students who were, uh, who identify as a indigenous. And so it kind of gave us an opportunity, me and many of the teachers from certain parts of Peru, the opportunity to talk about what it's like to be minoritized in your home country, right? And so I had no, I had no challenges. Um, and I'm fortunate because I was working, am working with three other language specialists, and one of them also identifies African American. So um, when we had conversations, it was always very positive about our experiences and about how we connected with those um, teachers who identify as, as indigenous. Great. Thank you. Um, our next our next question uh, for a panelist is how were you able to bring your own culture and identity into your teaching and daily life in your country of assignment? Um, so Keisha, I think we'll ask you to to speak first, please. Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because um, I didn't really think about it as I was doing the job that I was pretty much contracted to do in Peru. And that was more about the, those teachers in their particular context than, than myself. And so I always focus on that. And so um, generally speaking, I just went in there being me, being who I am and identifying as a Black U.S. American who is bi-dialectal, bilingual, and, and giving them the opportunity to kind of focus on their cultural identity and their students' cultural identities and how in how their teaching can be more culturally responsive. And so I tended to focus more on them, but still be true to who I am by answering questions, by making sure that I speak in my various varieties of English so that they are able to experience that there are many different Englishes and you will encounter many different Englishes when you're out and about. And so I guess that is my answer to that particular question. 
Nice. Thank you. Hansley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to agree with what Keisha said. Um, being myself and, you know, bringing that exposure. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Montenegro is homogeneous. So, and one thing that uh, Rilo Russell said is that uh, we are really cultural ambassadors. So in my capacity, for a lot of people, I am the only Black person they've met. Or maybe they will have an opportunity to meet in the future. So um, there is a bit of... Um, social responsibility, so to speak. And I use those opportunities to find common ground. So two examples that I have is actually, one, I love hip hop music, big East Coast hip hop fan, if anybody's in there. Uh, so one thing in Montenegro is actually hip hop music is not so popular and it has a negative connotation. So Black History Month, I had the opportunity to give a workshop. I said, you know what? I'll give a workshop on the influence of hip hop. And during that workshop, uh, during my research for that workshop, I found an amazing connection that I didn't even know about, which was, you know, in Montenegro, there are a lot of social justice movements and um, protests and things of that nature. So uh, some time ago, early, uh, late 90s or so, uh, early 90s, Serbia and Montenegro had something going on. And in Serbia, there was an uprising and protest happening. There was a radio station called B92. And that radio station, which was really popular in Serbia, used when they were being silenced by their regime, instead of saying the words, they used a hip hop song, Fight the Police by a Public Enemy, as their you know, form of protest. And it would play that song over and over on the radio. And when I found that bit of information, um, I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. I had no idea it had reached that far. So I also learned something. And uh, I'm also going to give a part two to this. Uh, and it was a really, really awesome situation. This actually happened virtually, but even in person today, where I, as an English language fellow, you get the opportunity to work with access students, which are, uh, on, you know, teenage students who go through the U.S. Department of State uh, program. And they're learning English, and, but they have a lot of cultural discussions. So I would visit their classes often. The teachers would invite me. And one time we had, the first time I met these students, absolutely first time, they, they were asking me questions. And this was virtually during the protests. I'm talking about George Floyd. Uh, we had the uh, Central Park uh, Karen situation. Um, you know, all these things were happening in the United States. And they had floods of questions. And it was an amazing opportunity to say that I really enjoyed being in a space where people were genuinely asking me questions. What does this mean? And what's that? How did this happen? How, you know, and all these kind of things. And I can share my perspective uh, and, and bring that to their, you know, to them. And a lot of them on their own uh, further researched and further came back to me. Maybe they emailed me or something. So that was an amazing opportunity to share my culture and just, you know, the Black American experience. Thank you. A um, lot of opportunity there. Uh, Pearly, can I ask you to speak to this question? Yes, my experience is a little bit different from Hansley. I was part of an English club, but I went to a different, uh, different class and different part of Costa Rica every Saturday. So I had to quickly build a report with the students <laughs> and engage in a conversation that would be about an hour or so. And so when I first came in, they're a little quiet. And so I would start off by just sharing all of my cultures with them. I was born in New York, raised in Miami, lived in Texas. So I shared a little bit about all of that. And my, my parents are immigrants. So I shared a little bit about Haiti. So it was a great way to share all of that. And so I kept it really short and then I said, what about you all? And I gave each person an opportunity to share about themselves, what they like, where they're from. So it freed them up to talk and then they'd ask questions about all kinds of things. And I like to play Jeopardy. So there's usually a game about it's for you know listening skills. So what did you learn about Haiti? What did you learn about Florida, what about Texas? So um, it was a great opportunity to bring all of my cultures into the classroom with a different group every week. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thanks for that. I'll ask you a, another question here, a new topic. Uh, how has your experience with English language programs impacted, enhanced, and furthered uh, your TESOL career? Um, and if you're not in, in a point where you know those things yet, then we can ask, uh, what kind of experience do you think you're gaining now that will ultimately further your TESOL career? 
Um, so, Pearly, can I ask you to speak? Yes, um, for sure. I've learned to think fast on my feet <laughs> because you always have to find an alternative. Um, I started doing this in fall of 2020. It was my first time teaching synchronously. And so a lot of new skills as far as technology is concerned, but also what to do when technology is not working. So again, with the blackouts, the floods and everything else, alternatives, quickly getting on WhatsApp, creating a WhatsApp group with the students. So if Microsoft Teams isn't working, you have something else. Um, one other thing I learned is I use PowerPoint in presentations a lot. So being prepared to structure what I write in instructions in such a way that I can quickly copy and paste it into a Zoom chat. So if someone loses power and they come back in, I can easily paste that and get um, participants back into whatever we're doing so they're not lost. So it's, it's caused me to think a little bit differently about teaching and how to, different strategies. And I would say it's just a great experience to try different strategies with teachers, with participants, with STEAM students. Um, it's, it's been an amazing experience for me. Excellent, thanks. Um, Hansley, can I ask you to comment here? Sure. Uh, so, absolutely, uh, the opportunity to try new things. I've never been a, a teacher trainer before. I've done small workshops for my public school district in the past, but nothing on the capacity that I'm doing now, uh, which is amazing. But I would also like to add that the opportunity to learn. So, there are educational courses that are offered to us as fellows during, during our uh, fellowship. Um, one of the ones that I really enjoyed was the trainer of trainers course. So if you become a fellow and you have that opportunity, it's really great. And then the other is there's a lot of opportunities just to connect with other fellows and people in your position. So um, that's also a great opportunity as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Keisha. Yes, for me, it's it's been great building a community of practice, not only across the U.S. with other um, English specialists, but also with those who are in Peru. I'm a full-time faculty member. I can't just get up and, and generally leave unless it's over the summer. And so this provided me the additional experience that I needed teaching in a non-U.S. context. And that's super important in some of our careers, professions, where we are planning on going. And so that's been very important. Uh, it's provided me lots of insight into the global situation. Um, like Pearly said, it's, it's really made me a lot more flexible. And as I think about teacher preparation, I can kind of use different contexts, the Peruvian context, and compare that to what's happening here in the U.S. with my teacher educators and just building that um, or teacher um pre-service and in-service teachers and building those connections. Um, also, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to provide accessible professional development opportunities. And at the very beginning of our symposium, the TESOL director talked about accessibility and making sure that there is access to all, right? And so for, for, uh, for me, this program has meant a whole lot because it, it, it allows that. It allows professional development to be accessible for those outside of um, our borders. And so um, it's been great. Excellent. Thanks. Um, so this brings me to our last uh, sort of st structured question for our panelists, uh, which is what recommendations do you have for any member of the Bell Path community who is considering a cultural exchange experience with English language programs? And I will throw this one over first to Hansley. Uh, I recommend doing it. It's, uh, it's an amazing experience. Um, and if you enjoy sharing your culture, it, it'll definitely provide you with the opportunity to do that. Uh, there may be challenges, but as we know, all those challenges are just opportunities to educate each other. So definitely do it. I, I recommend it. Thanks. Uh, Pearly, any ideas to share there? I agree with Hansley. I say do it. And you really are going to be a cultural ambassador and you're able to share so much about the culture of the United States and help people see um, different sides of it. So I, I highly encourage anyone who's considering it, do it. Excellent. Dr. Brian? 
Of course, I concur. It's an opportunity like no other. And let's be real, it's a paid opportunity. It pays very well, but it, you know, it gives us the opportunity to, especially as um, African Americans, as people who identify as Black or um, of a minoritized uh, racial identity, it gives us an opportunity to rewrite the images that people generally would see in the media and demonstrate our linguistic and pedagogical abilities. And so I think that it's an awesome opportunity. So thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you for those thoughts. That's really our, our structured questions we had ready for our panelists. Now I think we can open it to a little bit of Q&A and um, I will consult uh, some technical help we have here online. Uh, and it looks like we have a question uh, first uh, for Hansley, uh, and this question is, uh, did, did you learn the local language and what was it like living somewhere uh, if you didn't know the language? So uh, I am fortunate enough to, in Montenegro, fortunately, where I live, I live in the uh, capital city, Pogodica. Uh, most of the people speak English uh, to some degree, functionally. So I, I haven't had the motivation to uh, learn the language. But I will say, though, in Japan, um, I, there was no English. So if you're asking about what's it like living in a country with uh, and then not being able to communicate, uh, I would definitely suggest learning the language and picking up a few phrases to help you get around, especially if you're in a rural area or something of that nature where English may not be as popular. But uh, for the most part, you, you figure out ways to communicate. Just imagine if you have lower le level language speakers and how you conduct your lessons in that fashion. So uh, it's going to be like that all every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, that sounds fair. Um, skimming some other questions here. Um, hmm. uh, can you can you please share uh, how our international TESOL colleagues in attendance can engage with the specialists and fellow program, uh, even if they themselves are not specialists or fellows? So maybe if uh, you know Hansley, you're 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 there overseas. Um, do you feel um, how you know? Do do people around Montenegro come to? Do they know you're there? Um, or or Pearly, you've got a specific group of people you're in contact with, for example. Um, I don't know if there's other opportunities for people to come and interact with you. Um, I say that it depends on the fellow, at least fellows in the country. Uh, I think it depends on the fellow. We're pretty, we're pretty much assigned to who we're supposed to be working with. And oftentimes we do give workshops to general public and things that nature through maybe American Corners or some other program. And probably those will be the best opportunities to uh, engage with a fellow, unless you probably know them personally. But other than that, I'm not sure, to be honest. Nice, no, fair enough. And, um... You know, to, to anyone listening, I would say uh, at our website at AmericanEnglish.state.gov, any of our international participants, um, you can look for your nearest regional English language officer um, who can, uh, you know, connect you with resources available um, in your country or uh, specialists or virtual educators um, who are online nearby. Um, great. Thanks for that. Uh, so Dr. Brian, uh, a question for you. Was it tricky working full-time and doing the specialist project at the same time? Uh, well, fortunately, the second part is kind of like during the summer when I'm off contract, but in the spring, it was tricky. Um, but the fortunate part about that is that I was able to get a schedule of what my time with the um, Peruvian teachers would be like before I even started my spring semester. So I arranged my schedule around that time frame. Also, it was during COVID. So all of my courses were online. So I got to meet with my um, 
teachers, core teachers online. And I only taught maybe two courses in the spring. And so I was able to meet with them in the evenings, you know, once a week. So it wasn't very tricky. I say it can be tricky depending on your workload and what you do in academia. So for another colleague, um, she is, I think she teaches English for academic purposes. Her workload was a lot heavier than mine at her particular um, institution. And so it was quite um, tricky for her. Um, so it just depends on what your workload looks like where you, where you are. Fair enough. Uh, juggling is the busy people teachers mm -hmm. are, right? Um, Pearly, here's a question uh, directed towards you. Uh, do you stay in touch with your students from Costa Rica? Yes, I do. Um, I can, we uh, communicate with each other on WhatsApp. And in fact, I'm still in contact with the teachers that I worked with in 2020 and spring 2021. And what we've been doing is that we communicate by WhatsApp. And one of the teachers actually got a promotion and she invited me to her class this past spring. So it was really great to see her in action and what she's doing. And with the STEAM students that I work with, their coordinator has become a friend. And so we have coffee chats, they're virtual coffee chats every couple of weeks. So it's been good. Excellent. Um, great. So uh, another question for any of you, I'll just throw it open. Um, do you, uh, have you used or do you like using any of the other resources I sort of referred to in the presentation earlier? So uh, programs like Open or Forum Magazine, um, Hansley, you mentioned Access earlier, you know, which may or may not come across any of your other projects, um, any, any thoughts about any of the other resources and how they intersect with being a, a fellow specialist or virtual educator? Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone wants to indicate who would, who wants to, okay, Pearly, I saw you, okay. you first, thanks. I, I wanted to add that um, as a specialist or a virtual educator in person, you have access to the community of practice. So it's wonderful to be able to see what other, um, what your colleagues are doing. So it's easy to see what their projects are. Those, they'll post highlights and you can easily reach out to that person and say, hey, I loved what you did. Can I learn more about it? Sometimes they'll post a lesson plan or a rubric that you could use. So there are a lot of opportunities to connect with other fellows and other specialists and um, you can learn from them, they can learn from you, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, the CO, COP, there's a pretty active and a lot of resources being, being shared. I've always found that myself as well. Uh, Hansley, I saw you had a comment related to this. Uh, yeah, so, in, you know, depending on your project, you can be working with somebody or, you know, by yourself, independent. But using the COP and uh, the resource, looking at, you know, fellows post a lot of what they do in their in their roles. And it's great seeing some of the things that they're accomplishing because it also maybe gives you ideas or inspires you to go in a different direction. And then, as I said, connections are, are really, uh, really um, helpful, I guess. And uh, when you reach out to another fellow and you said, hey, how did you do this project in your, in your area? Can you give me some tips? And then, um, yeah, so I think COP is a really great resource slash tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for, thanks for those thoughts. Um, one, one more question um, that may be for Hansley uh, or Pearly, but maybe there's still a, a comment from Dr. Brian, uh, this is about the fellow application. Uh, someone's saying it's really long. Uh, any suggestions for tackling that? Hansley shaking his head. <laughs> yeah. Surprising for a government program to have a long application process, but you know. Um, any thoughts for getting that done? I, I, the only thing I could say one day at a time, uh, give yourself time to do it. Don't wait till the day before or two days before. Uh, definitely, you know, yeah, give yourself time. That's the only thing I can suggest. Fair. Any, any other thoughts to add? 
Um, yeah, it takes time, but you know, you we we heard your encouragement earlier, so maybe it's worth tackling anyhow. Uh, Hansley, yeah. And if I could also say that uh, pay attention to the deadline. Um, not giving too much of myself out there, but I did complete it like a day before the deadline and you still get the opportunity. So uh, they're very fair about, you know, once you get your application in by the deadline, um, you know, you, you still have an opportunity to be heard. Excellent. Well, and it's your, it's your opportunity exactly as you say to be heard and to put in there, um, you know, all, all of your own excellent experience you have to share and to, to make very clear to everyone reviewing these things, um, mm -hmm. everything you have to, to offer. So all, all of the details are really important. It's your chance to make a compelling case. Um, yeah, and help match the amazing expertise you have to offer to, to interesting programs abroad, right? Dr. Bryan. Yeah, I think the application for the specialists um, is a little bit different if I'm recalling. I don't I, I don't recall. I think Erin Waters, one of my colleagues, are she's on here and she she works in Peru with me. Um, I think you just submit for those who are interested in the specialists. I remember submitting my Vita. Um, but I also remember submitting it a year before I was contacted. And so I actually had to update um, my CV and I was given a bit of advice. You, for the, for the specialist, um, you need to figure out what your area of expertise is. So TESOL is very broad, you know, and ESL very broad. And so are you tech not focused on technology, right? Are you more focused on assessment? Are you focused on, you know, culturally and linguistic response, linguistically responsive education? So that needs to be clear because reloads are looking for a specific people to fill specific needs. And so um, one of the suggestions that was given to me was basically be very specific about what your fo focus, foci is for your particular, um, you know, application. That sounds like excellent advice. The details are really important, uh, especially for specialist applications, but for any of the projects um, that come across. So um, it's worth sharing everything you, you have to, to say in those. So um, that is great advice all the way around. Um, for, well, for any of our exchange programs also, you know, with any of the other uh, opportunities I mentioned, like um, taking on uh, live webinars uh, or any of the virtual programs also. So um, please keep in mind the domestic outreach uh, newsletter I mentioned earlier, any opportunities to, uh, you know, apply for, um, you know, open opportunities through the open program or others would be announced there. Um, and here, again, is information for uh, the English language programs, exchange programs. There you see emails uh, for fellow specialist and virtual educator uh, programs where you can send additional questions as needed or uh, consult the or website there, elprograms.org. Um, great. Well, I think that's a been about our time, but um, audience, thank you very much for your attention and your questions. Panelists, esteemed panelists, thank you very much for being here today and sharing your, uh, your experiences um, as educators and cultural ambassadors, a term which carries some weight, but um, you know, we thank you very much for your service there as, uh, as program participants. And thanks again to our, our BELPATH organizers for including us in your program today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I will turn it back over, I believe, to our organizers. Thanks again. Thank you very much. The, the, the pleasure is all ours. We appreciate this very, very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Mr. Barzik and to the State Department this has been a great inspiration and very informative. 
We congratulate you on the excellent work that you've done and on the way that you have represented the United States and um, your various ethnicities and cultural backgrounds. So thank you very much.